Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Chan and welcome to another episode of the Alphabet Psalms where we explore two segments of Psalm 119 each week. Guess what? We are now on the last four letters of Psalm 119. This week I'll be going to do the first two and Dan Forrest will be wrapping up our entire series with the last two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But before we begin, customarily, we start off with a video. And so, here it is. Enjoy. Well, old timer, I guess this is the end of the road. I know I haven't always been a good kid, but if I have to go to school tomorrow, I'll fail the test and be held back. I just need one more day to study, Lord. I need your help. Prayer. The last refuge of a scoundrel. A teacher strike, a power failure, a blizzard, anything that'll cancel school tomorrow. I know it's asking a lot, but if anyone can do it, you can. Thanking you in advance, your pal, Bart Simpson. Prayer, the last refuge of a scoundrel. This scene was from an episode of a long running animated TV series called The Simpsons. Some of you are familiar with them. This one is entitled, Bart Gets an F in Season 2, Episode 1. The episode had a simple narrative. Bart, never known for being studious, is failing school and is faced with an imminent threat of repeating 4th grade if he fails his history test. Now, in my opinion, this is a very tough exam, even for a 4th grader. He tries everything to help him study, including enlisting a smart kid named Martin, to help him develop better study habits. But unfortunately, none of his tactics worked. So, the day of the exam was near. In fact, it was the next day. And he was desperate. He needed a lifeline, a rescue, a miracle, a salvation from the old man himself, which he seems to be referring to God himself, Yahweh. So. Bart kneels down and begins to pray. No, actually, the better word for this is plea to God for salvation, to give him one more day to study. What happens then? Snow. The snow came down so heavily overnight that the next day, school was closed and Bart was given another day to study. He almost forgot his promise he made with God until his sister, Lisa, reminded him that he owed God Big time. And so Bart returned to study to fulfill his oath with God. Now, why on earth did I show you this episode? <laughs> A pagan episode. To kick us off with the next two segments of Psalm 119 called Kof and Resh. Today, I want to explore the whole practice of prayer with all of you. Are we treating prayer like Bart Simpson? Do we pray when we need a lifeline? Or do we pray as an obligation, like pray before meals, pray before we go to bed? How should a genuine prayer life look like? Let's begin by reading Kof, starting with verse 145. I cry out with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. I cry out to you, save me and I will keep your testimonies. I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. My eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. O Lord, revive me according to your justice. They draw near who follow after wickedness. They are far from your law. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Considering your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. Three times, the psalmist used the word cry, right in the beginning of Kaf. The first two use the Hebrew word kara, which means to verbally cry out and scream like a beast. I don't know what that means, but I trust it's like a werewolf. While the third Hebrew word used for cry is shava, which means a cry for help. Folks, the point that sticks out for me in these three verses of cough is this. There is no mandatory requirement for our prayers to be neat, tidy, and spiritually sounding and aesthetically pleasing. 
The psalmist here sounds raw, and much like Bart Simpson, he's priming God that he's going to be brutally honest with him. God wants us to be brutally honest, transparent, and tell him everything that is bugging us and what we've been thinking about that has overwhelmed us and kept us awake at night. And yes, he wants you to be brutally honest among your Christian sisters and brothers when we're praying to God. Allow our sisters and brothers in our small groups to listen to our prayers so that they can pray with us and for us while we pray. See, I fall into this trap as well. So many times I just ask prayer requests and go around the circle in my groups and ask them, what would you like me to pray for? And when really, it should be each person praying honestly and out loud to God while others listen in and pray with them and sometimes pray for them when the Spirit moves them to. When we tell others of our prayer requests, we tend to manufacture them and tidy them up so it doesn't make us look like what we truly are, i.e. a horrible mess. Rosalind Rinker in her book, Prayer, How to Have a Conversation with God, says that we tidy up so much our prayer requests, our that our prayers sound like prayer speeches at God, not even with God, at God. However, if we can create a space where each person can vocally express their frustration, hurts, concerns, and burdens out loud to God while everyone else listens, I believe that's a start of an authentic and genuine prayer to God, an actual conversation with God. We're not done with these three verses though, because the psalmist intends us to sit on these three verses for a little longer, since he did group these three verses with the word cry. If you're following what I just presented, you might ask, hey, John, isn't that how Bart Simpson prayed to God? I'm assuming that that's not the way we should pray, right? But it seems like you're telling us to pray like Bart. Well, yes and no. Yes, it is similar to the way Bart Simpson prayed, I believe that Bart was being genuine and honest in his prayer, and he definitely cried out to God with what was in his heart. Yet in the same time, no. The heart of the prayer for Bart was to not fail the exam and be held back a grade. Bart's prayer was basically for God to provide him with a miracle so that he can keep his pride and not be in the same class as his sister next year. Newsflash. God is not concerned about our careers or our achievements. Really, for Bart, God cares about whether Bart will realign his life back to him if he responds to his prayer requests. For us as well, if God responds to our prayers, would we realign our lives back to him? Will we make him the Lord of our life and that we submit to his authority? Or are we Bart Simpson? See, Dallas Willard, in his book, Hearing God, asks a poignant question that we should ask ourselves when we pray. Why should God answer our requests? The psalmist knows his life purpose. He is alive to bring pleasure to God, to have fellowship with God, and obey God's commands, to be God's servant. And that's why at every cry, at every plea from the psalmist, he follows up with the following statements of promise because he knows why he exists. Quote, I will keep your statutes. I will keep your testimonies and I will hope in your word, i.e., I will serve and obey God. Do we sometimes pray and desire God to answer our prayers? See, I made it a habit in my prayers now to write my request in my journal first before I begin to pray. Then I would start a new paragraph and give it some thought as to why I am making these requests. Most of the time, the requests are eliminated or change and become less me-centered and more other-centered because I ask myself, why should God answer my requests? For if God responds to my requests, it serves his purpose to further his kingdom. If my request is not centered on this, why should he answer it? Here's an example. Common requests that I usually hear and find myself sometimes requesting are health, safety, and financial provision. Do we center these requests by saying, Hey, God, give me good health so that I can keep your commands, serve your purpose, and be used by you? Or give me fill in the blank so that I can keep your commands, serve your purpose, and be used by you? 
Do we have that heart of intent when we make our requests? Or are we just requesting it for ourselves and sanctifying them with Christian jargon? When God does respond to our prayer requests, does our faith strengthen and become devoted in obeying his commands and abiding ourselves in scripture? That's one key difference that differentiates the psalmist prayers versus Bart Simpson-like prayers. The question is for all of us is, what kind of prayers do we do? The next key difference is the role of scriptures. The psalmist had the Torah. Today, we have the Bible. When we pray, is our time with God embedded into our reading of scriptures, or is the Bible absent when we pray? Do we read scriptures before and after we pray? Do we pray during our reading of scriptures? Does scripture have any presence when we pray? For Bart Simpson, it was pretty obvious that he didn't read the Bible prior to praying, nor did he read it during or after. He prayed because it was his last refuge of a scoundrel, his last car to play, so to speak. The psalmist says in the remaining verses of Kof that he keeps his eyes awake to meditate on God's word. Day and night, he meditates on God's word. Why? Because the psalmist believes that praying is not a one-way monologue. Praying is a dialogue. Rosalind Rinker says that many times our prayers are speeches to God or worse, at God. We make it eloquent as if God desired a speech and nothing more. Yet our prayers should be in dialogue with God. We also have to take moments of silence and read God's word in between our prayers. During, after, in between, we pray for that's God's way of having a conversation with us. Bart Simpson was obviously speaking to God with a speech. He didn't go to the Bible afterwards or meditate on God's word. We ought not to follow that pattern. When we pray, we ought to be intentional to have God's word present and embedded into our prayer time. Not only does this enable us to have a conversation with God, but it also helps us realign and evaluate our prayer requests to him. The last notable difference between Bart Simpson's prayer and the psalmist is that Bart never confessed or admit of his wrongdoing before God. He doesn't acknowledge that he doesn't deserve God to respond to his requests. All he did was make a plea or beg God for a miracle. The psalmist, though, knew that whatever God gives is really by God's grace, and whatever God withholds is really God's mercy. Why do I say that? The psalmist says the following, According to your loving kindness, O Lord, revive me according to your justice. First, let's take a look at the word justice. The psalmist knew that he is at the mercy of God. God has every right to give according to what we have done and how faithful we have been. The psalmist also acknowledges that God can do beyond that, that God has his own way of being just and that justice executed through God's loving kindness towards us. Let me give you an example. My wife and I sometimes wonder why God showed us favor in various areas in our lives. In our minds, we ask ourselves, hey, we don't deserve it, do we? We don't think we've done enough or we're faithful enough to deserve his favor, yet God showed favor to us in various aspects. The psalmist reminds us that there will be times where we can't make the cause and effect connection in our minds. What we do know is that God loves us very much and would do things and show favor to us because he loves us so much. And remember, The reason why he shows favor is for us to bring pleasure, obey him, and be a blessing to others. In other words, his servant. Let's move on to Resh. Verse 153. Consider my afflictions and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. Many are my persecutors and my enemies, yet I do not turn from your testimonies. I see the treacherous and am disgusted because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. 
In Resh, we can see the psalmist has interweaved his prayer requests of salvation from his enemies within the principles of how he prays to God. And so, let's remove the portions of his specific prayer requests, because we've already done that for the past few chapters, and we let us draw some principles to apply in our prayer life. What are these principles? The psalmist gave us some markers for us to identify them. Twice the psalmist mentions the word consider. Three times the psalmist mentions revive. The mention of consider is the psalmist's acknowledgement that God determines how much suffering we are going through, not us. This is hard truth to accept because many times when we are going through suffering, we believe that the suffering is beyond us and unbearable that the suffering is unfair and unjust and, what, and we don't deserve the kind of suffering we are experiencing. Why me, O oh Lord? The truth is, God decides what we can and cannot bear. God decides how much to alleviate and how much suffering should be left on us. This takes a lot of humility to acknowledge. And the psalmist here reminds himself and us that God is ultimately the judge as to how much suffering will be given and how much suffering he will take away. We have no say. Interestingly, God also advocates for us on our behalf. So he's the judge and the lawyer. The reason we suffer is really because of ourselves and our fallenness. Suffering leads to death, ultimate death. Yet God advocates for us, or how this translation says, pleads for us through Jesus' death and resurrection. And we are saved from that ultimate end. And lastly, three times he mentions revive, which means it's quite important. Why do we pray then? Because it's a privilege that was made available when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We pray because we can. Prayer is full access into the presence of God and to not only have conversation with God, but also to find life, restoration, a revival, a revival for our soul. Prayer is tapping into God's covenant that he made with humanity through Jesus, that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have eternal flourishing life. Prayer enables us to experience the Trinity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the true community, the true love that human beings can never provide us with. Yes, not even our spouses. Prayer is a privilege that God gave to us in Jesus so that we can be quickened. What do I mean by that? More joy, more life, more vitality, more energy, more understanding of what's going on in the world, more of everything that will enable us to experience God. And so to conclude, I would like to ask all of you, how is your prayer life? Maybe it's time to have an honest conversation with God rather than having speeches to God. See, sometimes when we pray, we repeat certain words like, oh God, oh God, or yeah, please, oh please, or like um, just repeating words to make sure that we sound eloquent and sound spiritual and be aesthetically pleasing. Yet God doesn't want that, does he? He wants a true, loving conversation with him, a relationship. He doesn't want to be rushed. He doesn't want you to be rushed. He wants us to take time in conversation with him. It, a time of reading his word and a time of praying to him and with him and allowing his spirit speak to us. See, he's waiting for all of us to have a conversation with him. Will you do that? Amen.